She is the founder and executive director of the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. Dr. Sethi is featured in the upcoming film, The Last Ecstatic Days. She's an emerging and important voice for shifting our culture's understanding and approach to dying, death, and bereavement. And Claire Duplace, beautiful human right here, is an end-of-life doula, a grief consultant through the Institute for the Study of Birth, Breath, and Death, a creative grief practitioner, and she holds certifications in numerous grief and death-related practices. She received a master's in mindfulness studies from Lesley University and is training to become a grief movement guide. Claire shares the vision of shifting the paradigm and showing up for all involved in end-of-life care and bereavement situations. Thank you both for joining us in this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So just to kind of segue right in, I want to ask both of you, and you can decide who answers first, how did you come to working in this field <laughs> of grief and end-of-life care? Yeah, so um, in 2017, my mom was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, and I ended up being with her while she was in hospice, which only ended up being about a week. And she was pretty much my initiation into the realms of grief and death. So right around that, after she died, I just started training and studying and experiencing all things grief and death related. Um, and then I had been teaching at the school where DT's kids started. And so circled around a DT for years, pretty much. Um, and then we decided to meet one day for coffee. And she was like, oh, I have this, you know, vision of this community death centered care place. And I was like, well, that sounds amazing. Sign me up, like deeply answered prayer of my own heart. Didn't even really know how that was even like a thing or possible. But mm -hmm. talking with the DT, I was just like, yeah, that sounds like everything I want to be a part of. So it's been what, like a year and a half now? I was one of the first groups to go through a training there, and now we get to train others as they come in, and it's just getting to be bedside is just one of the most amazing gifts, and I never would have thought I would be doing this. I was a teacher for a long time, and now I don't picture myself doing anything else. Hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. So deeply personal, and also strange, a strange way to kind of go from your, your the process of being with your mom as she passed, but then also teaching, circling around the DT, <laughs> and then coming in from the beginning. Yeah. And what about you, Dr. Sethi? So, you know, I, I feel like the work around with death and dying sort of found me. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, via, you know, I was born in India, moved to Georgia via Wales when I was three, and we go back to India periodically, and I remember um, seeing the full spectrum of life in each moment, you know, the poverty, the suffering, the death, the, um, the joy, the bliss, the food, the celebration, the colors, all of it. And then I would come home and there was this sort of manicured, you know, pristine, um, view that I would, I would only see that. And so I think I had some existential <laughs> angst, you know, and just questions from a young age. Who am I? What am I doing here? Why am I not one of those children that are begging in the streets of India? That really had an impact on me when I was younger. Um, and then just going through the teenage years of disconnect and um, still asking those questions, I came across um, uh, an opportunity to volunteer for hospice when I was 17. And oh, I remember, wow. yeah, I was an undergrad and they had this big volunteer fair and this hospice of Charlotte Booth was there. And the woman said, hey, let me tell you about hospice. And let me tell you how you can sit at the bedside of people who are dying and support them in their final days. And just something in my being resonated. And I thought, what, first of all, what do you mean we're going to die? We're all going to die? And it was just this awareness of the temporary nature of life. And then the fact that nobody was talking about it, I didn't, um, it, it was just struck me. And so that, I became a hospice volunteer then. And that shaped me, guided, stayed with me. Those experiences stayed with me. Through my medical training, I did. Um, I studied in at the Medical College of Georgia um, in med school, and there was no very little training on end of life care. And so that was having had those experiences, you know, earlier, I was very aware that people aren't really talking about death and approaching death with um, 
with an awareness of its gifts and its teachings and the reality that it's a part of life. And so that stayed with me as well. And I ended up coming to Asheville to study family medicine, where I met Brian Lewis and Chad Cassell. And um, then studied, uh, specialized in hospice palliative care and worked in an inpatient hospice center for 10 years. And then had some life changes that have led me to what she was sharing. <laughs> so I'll share some of that later. Yeah. Sounds, I didn't realize that your journey into the hospice sphere started before your medical training. That's amazing that that was, that set you up as you went into medical school. And also what a, what a deeply beautiful tapestry of a background mm. to contextualize this conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what do you both feel just to kind of shift the conversation a little bit? How do you both see the challenges to the, the areas of grief and end of life care in our culture and in our community here? <laughs> <laughs> Besides complicated. I mean, there's so much to say and I feel like grief is such an individual solo journey in a lot of ways and yet it's such a collective thread that you know that we're all connected to and i think grief is always connected to a death or something like that whereas like we're there's so many types of grief and we grieve for so many different reasons and ways our whole lives um but some i've been having lots of conversations about this lately because it feels like grief workers and death workers like myself, it feels like an uphill battle in a lot of ways to kind of get that, get these spaces kind of going. And it's interesting because we need them so much. And so why is something that we need so much feel like such a challenge to bring to that collective sphere? Mm -hmm. And so things like CCLD and, and creating spaces for people to take up space with their grief, with conversations around this, creating, you know, connections with impermanence, because mm -hmm. it is like we are, we are all from the moment we're born, we're dying. So to me, we live in this kind of grief denying culture in a lot of ways. I mean, there's been a lot of waking up. I really think since COVID too, there's been a lot, a big shift, but you can feel how thirsty collectively we are. I know for myself to be a part of this work because it's so deeply connected to this like innate inherent piece of us. And it's a remembering of an old way of doing things. And I feel like because we've lost this village mentality we become so disconnected from those old ways and serving at the bedside and supporting people through grief or whatever process feels like we're tapping back in to that space. Reclaiming the connection that, that you were speaking to, feeling there's this disconnect in our, in our culture here that is distinct from when you would go home or go back mm. to India and then you'd come home here and things felt so separate. And so what I'm hearing you say is that in our culture, in a, in a big sense, there's a disconnect between our sense of mortality, but also the process of dying and grief. There's not space for it to be in the center of our culture. Well, there's just so much hustle to keep moving and to keep moving on. Yeah. And you don't move on from things. You, you know, you move forward into learning how to integrate it into your life. It's yeah. not. It's not this like, all right, are you done yet? Are you done being sad? Are you done, you know? It's like, how can I learn to integrate this into my life and move forward with this loss in a way that's not a burden? And I feel like it's the same feeling around death. It's how can we come to uh, create containers and spaces to talk about the fear around it, mm -hmm. to talk about the unknown and what that is because it's something we don't touch until we're there. And, and even then it's like that person is doing it. It's not like they come back and they're like, well, you know, I mean, people have near death experiences, but you know what I mean? It's, there needs to be conversation and space to feel okay to say, this feels really scary to me. Yeah. Um, because it, it feels that way because it's unknown, but, 
we need to develop a connection with the unknown in a way that allows um, permission and to normalize the conversation around it. We need to develop cultural space for connecting to, to all of what you just said and, make, and letting that be okay. Because mm -hmm. what I think I just heard you say is it's not just the disconnect, it's not just that we're in that rush to move on as a culture for everything, right? But also that we are being rushed past grief and rushed past conversations about grief and impermanence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. for you? What, what's coming up for me is also just the, the amount of time we get to, you know, for bereavement care, bereavement, bereavement leave. Oftentimes in corporate, the corporate world is very short, like two to three days, you know. Yeah. And to think about a lifetime of relationship and connection mm -hmm. and to have that, you know, that be a time frame to get over it or get through it yeah. is just, a tell. it's very telling. Um, and I think you know, growing up again in the South, but also just, I think in our culture, it's, you know, having, being all put together and having um, just our own, disc our, our discomfort with being real with one another and being vulnerable with one another. I think that's a big piece of why things are the way they are too. And what came, comes first, I don't know. But um, I think when someone dies or when someone's experiencing the death of a relationship or a job or whatever, you know, all the different types of grief, you know, as friends or as community members, it's like, we're not so comfortable. Mm -hmm. How do we show up for one another? And how do, what do we say? And what do we not say? And um, yeah, just acknowledging that, that sometimes just presence and being with is the most important thing. Yeah. So creating space, being with, presence. And that, I mean, that, that connects to the next question, which is what have you found to be helpful in supporting the processes of grief and end of life care. Um, can you speak more to the way in which presence and making space for these processes mm. is, is the work that you do? Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up doing an end of life doula training. Um, and I was so, after having done hospice work for so long, I was really um, moved and surprised by um, that experience of being trained as a death doula because, and people ask, why would you do that when you already have the skills? But what I realized was, um, I was viewing death as a medical event mm. and I was sort of, um, I had forgotten that, that it is really a communal, relational, spiritual experience mm -hmm. and that, and also the grief in the grief aspect, I thought I was pretty good at compartmentalizing and dealing with my you know, I go with a 26 bed facility I worked in. Each room had its own story and in its own um, souls that were needing love and attention. And I would have to go from one room to the next and I would take a deep breath and I would move forward. And, you know, so and I thought I did a pretty good job of um, leaving work behind and moving on. But in the doula training, we did a grief ceremony, which was new for me. And there was something about the somatic experience being with music being in a space, a circle, and um, that really opened my heart and made me realize I was storing grief in different places and not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. And so I wept and I, I was weeping for all of those souls that I had taken care of, even though, you know, so it, it, again, creating spaces, creating yeah. opportunities to emote and to be with each other in those spaces, um, to acknowledge and not to just dismiss. I think those are ways that can really support the grieving process for sure. Yeah, and I did my death training through a community death care program. And it was, again, that idea of remembering how this kind of thing was always done in community and that anyone can serve the dying. Hmm. Um, and so part of what we do at the center is also, you know, empowering families, caregivers, loved ones to be a part of the process so that it doesn't feel so like a disconnected piece that there's still such a beautiful like threshold to walk through together even though the person is going to be going the rest of the way on their own there's an opportunity for that family to be a part of it and it's been one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed in my life to be in the company of families feeling that 
agency, that empowered feeling that like, just because we're, you know, part of the center and this is what we do, that they can come in and say, oh, like I tap into that instinctual intuitive self mm -hmm. and say, oh, I, okay, I know how to do this mm -hmm. and presence and witnessing the process of it and asking questions like, is this okay that they're going through that? Is this, and normalizing the conversation around the process of dying and what it looks like and that it's all relative to, you know, whatever they're coming in with, but finding a way to reframe language around it so that it doesn't feel so far removed that it becomes more um, familiar. The poetry of what you both just shared is so poignant, right? The reconnecting to the process of dying and bringing family connection and community connection back in with agency mm -hmm. at each of the stages. Um, how do you, how do you facilitate that? How do you, I mean, in, in the, in the hospice community, in the medical community, in, 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 in the community at large, what have you found that helps to invite that outside of CACLD or where with them? Yeah. So hospice has come a long way and yeah. it's, you know, since the sixties and it is, it offers um, significant support for people to die in their homes. Most people want to die in their homes. And you know, you have the support of nurses, CNAs, doctors, chaplains, social workers, but you don't have that 24 seven support. So the teams that do come into the home, they really seek to educate family members, empower each one of you to take care of your loved one. Um, and that's where, you know, so that's that's what is in existence. And that's 100% covered by Medicare, Medicaid. It's a wonderful service. And there's certain gaps that I was noticing. And that's sort of how this path to the Center for Conscious Living and Dying emerged. Um, and some of that is education upstream of a crisis. Oftentimes mm -hmm. people are, you're only having this conversation when there's a crisis and you're having to have the conversation. Yeah. You can't ignore it anymore. Yeah. So upstream of that, can we engage like we're doing tonight? engage in this conversation and connect and um, ponder the questions and explore the options together. Um, so that's part of the work of the center. Um, and then offering 24 seven care with volunteers is one of the major parts of the CCLD way of direct care for those who are dying um, in, in this home setting um, and empowering families when they're able to care, but not having them be the sole caregivers, which is a huge burden yeah. for families incredibly difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, and they're already going through that, you know, grieving process already before the, you know, however long that, that loved one has been going through their illness, I mean, the anticipatory grief, and they're moving through that already. And so providing a container for them to be held in both of those realms at the same time is huge. You know, so it's like holding them in that grief, normalizing that, being present, not forcing it, just being being there, and then empowering them through education and experience and shadowing. I mean, they watch what we're doing, and we invite them. To, you know, would would this feel okay for you? You know, it's like it's a language thing of of an invitation rather than what it's always felt like it's going to be, where it's like all these wires and people in and out. It's like very much. Um, feels like, you know, we create a little cave. That's how it feels, a little womb. A little space of mm -hmm. sacred connection. Mm -hmm. And again, agency and education, you've both mentioned several times, mm -hmm. catching an upstream part of the community when people are not yet in crisis mm -hmm. and being able to help people to engage with these questions and how they might want to navigate situations like this. Mm -hmm before they're in the situations and their own personal acute grief. Um, and was there anything else that either of you wanted to speak to the, either of those questions? I mean, and to, to create a process for supporting them after they leave the center is a big piece of what, like I'm on the grief team that we're working on a bereavement process because so often you have this cathartic, experience and this loved one is gone and so now you're grieving and going through all that and so there's a process to to check to check in and hospice has a process you know up to a few months 
but we become so close with the people that come that it feels only natural to continue some sort of a connection that says this wasn't just this few days or this these few weeks that this is really meaningful for us and you've been a teacher for us too like you've been a gift for us yeah. too and that reciprocity you know it's not so transactional in a community supported model you have that that ability there is there's boundaries per se but not as rigid as in the healthcare model and something else that i was thinking about is the your title that you chose of this presentation the letting go the art of letting go yeah. i think you know what i'm fascinated with and curious about is how much do we practice death in in our lives mm -hmm. how do how do we die before we die you know the great mystics talk about that and and letting go what, what does it feel like to, what how do you process and experience the cascade of losses along the road to death because there's there's a lot of them yeah and aging parents you know there's a lot that we um can explore together given the opportunity you know that we tend to ignore because we don't have much guidance well, in this, this modern world so true mm -hmm. and in listening to you both it's not just that there's not a lot of guidance but the system that we have set up it sounds like maybe it's changed to some degree but in medical school it sounds like there's not a lot of space for talking about this kind of healing or this kind of dying process that the two of you are speaking to where it's community-based where there's agency where there's time before during and after it doesn't that doesn't exist within the the mainstream medical model and less so now with the changes in regulations i watched hospice shift in my mm -hmm. 20 years um, from being more grassroots to being a little bit more regulated, mm -hmm. which shifts things. Which, and it's an amazing organization doing Absolutely. amazing work. And there are those limitations within the transactional nature of the system. And so it sounds like both of you and in, in the work that you're, you're speaking to, trying to find the community, mm -hmm. the connection, the agency, and the continuity of relationship mm -hmm. so that it's, you know, a, a I think of a quilt, like in hospice, the hospice mm -hmm. centers that I've been in, there's the quilt yeah. that, that people can work on while their loved ones are, are in the dying process. And just the, the tapestry of building those relationships mm -hmm. and allowing the memories to continue to have a place and a communal memory. So it's important. Mm -hmm. And bringing in ritual and ceremony mm -hmm. and art and food and all the things until you can't enjoy them anymore. Yeah. And you turn completely inward. And yeah. but having and access, case. yeah, in the case. yeah, and providing the container for whoever comes through the doors to to be with the process in the way that feels most nourishing to them. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been different every person we've cared for up till now. It's like some some come in and it's just very quiet and very internal the whole time, and then at the end there's like this real big release, and then the other one we cared for the family i mean it was hustle and bustle the whole time stories food cooking nonstop. i mean laughter <laughs> you'd walk in and you could just hear everything so grateful dead fans it was fun <laughs> yeah i mean dancing like singing wow but it's a testament to how um, to what we're creating that it feels like a, a home it really in every sense of the word and by empowering, and I can feel myself talking more and more quietly, that this topic feels so sacred and important. Mm -hmm. And I can feel like we're just like hushed. <laughs> we're talking. How, what does the sound can, man can say? Can you hear us in the back? <laughs> OK, talk, talk loud. I was like, is he doing a thumbs up? <laughs> thumbs up. This is great material. And also, talk louder. <laughs> yeah. But the it sounds to me like in, in that, in, in, in the work that you're doing, the art of coming together and creating agency for people in the dying process also allows there to be an honoring of that unique personality of the individual of the family and that has to change the grieving process um anything else yeah. before we shift on to another question oh, how long do we want to be i mean we have 31 minutes, <laughs> but also the, the conversation yeah, yeah. can continue in other ways. Yeah, sure. 
No, I would say that I will say that one of the things that we're bringing in is um, the elements and nature. So that when people have died at the center, there has been a fire going 24 seven mm. for, for those that are in their fasting days. And that fire has been such an anchor anchoring point for not only the people serving, but also the families going through yeah. their experience. And the, met the what we've been told is that that it has been so transformative for the loved ones to have that space to go to, to process, to be held, you know, by nature and each other. That's really beautiful. powerful. Yeah. It's powerful. Okay. I mean, I was just speaking of that and, and the power of story, working mm -hmm. on bringing um, narrative medicine to the center mm -hmm. as a gift of preserving those stories. So much comes out at the end that, I mean, Bonnie Rare wrote a book about the five regrets of the dying and the pattern that she saw at people at end of life. And it, it was pretty much the same five things as I worked too much. I didn't connect with family and friends enough, things along that those lines. Mm -hmm. And so, so much comes out and yet it feels so hush. And so in, in a hospital setting, whereas you have a setting like this, there's more space to, to be able to share and, and to, you know, be storytellers. And if the resident, you know, is unable to do that, the family comes in with that and preserving those stories for them, but also as a gift for the for the families. And you talked about a quilt. Was, I really want to have a quilt at the center that has all the people we care for, like an image sewn in or their picture or something as because there's something really beautiful about a quilt and it yeah. feels very much like what we're doing yeah. in a visual way. Leaving, leaving the old traditions in as well. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, as I'm listening to you both, I'm realizing for folks who are joining, who maybe online, who are not in this community, I want to distill some of what you're saying and, and sharing for those who don't have a Center for Conscious Living and Dying that is emerging in their community yet. Uh, ritual and connecting to nature and in some way finding a, 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 an avenue to have that be a part of the process community, family, agency, um, trying to start having these conversations as families and as communities now before there's a crisis and beginning to lean into the discomfort, the uncertainty, the art, the, mm -hmm. and the discomfort, and the discomfort <laughs> yes. Yes. Of, of talking about all of this um, and finding out in the unique language and culture of each family or each community, what does that look like? And, Anything else that you would recommend for people who aren't here, who, for, from what you've learned? Yeah, their death, the death doula movement is booming. Yeah, and it I is. think um, so. You can go to the National End of Life Doula Association website, NIDA, and look up a doula in your community. In Asheville, they joke we. I think we have one of the highest concentrations of yeah. doulas. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <Death> <laughs> doulas. So you you can just call us and find us here, but in your community, wherever you are. Um, you can access that resource. And I can put a link to that in the online forum mm -hmm. so that people can access that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I mean, just finding the resources, there's more than we even know. I mean, there's so many books. There's so many because people will come to me and they're like, I want to be a death doula. And I'm like, OK, have you done any internal like moments or reflection on how you feel about death, Have how you feel if you're going to see someone dying, how you just some of that prep work, you know, is really important. Yeah. I mean, if if I hadn't gone through the experience with my mom, it would have been a, a different journey for me to then land in death school and to then land at this. I have this experience and, I'm, and I know it's a privilege and I'm grateful for that experience, but there's an in, there's some internal kind of prep to do because it, I mean, you have people just walking and they're like, Oh, that person's dying or that person's dead if they've never experienced that before it it can bring up a lot at the bedside for for caregivers and for family and so conversation again like you said before that moment so that there's room for whatever's going to come up in that moment but there's already been um, some attention and some awareness given to it because it it will things will come up yeah you know and it sounds like that's important regardless of your background, right? Even if you are have been volunteering in hospice mm -hmm. or you have been working as a hospice doctor or you have been at the bedside of a loved one passing, 
in my, in, in, I don't know about everyone else, but in my experience, every death I've witnessed has been hard and has brought a lot of material up, whether it's a loved one that I'm sitting with or whether it's an animal or a, a, a friend. Just every single death has been so beautiful and hard. So beginning to do self-inquiry and begin begin that work. Mm -hmm. Look up online, the National End of Life Doula Association. Association yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to segue to a different question. <laughs> okay. You were recently in a, in a documentary, um, The Last Ecstatic Days. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about that documentary that's forthcoming, going to be accessible to, to watch, yes. I think? Yes. So the story of this, should, oh, this should, talk no, should I repeat this louder? <laughs> you were recently in a documentary, I'm sorry. The Last Exotic Days, can, can you tell us about it? Yes, yeah, so The Last Ecstatic Days features Ethan Sisser, and he was a 36-year-old, young, amazing soul that um, was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, like Claire's mom, and he had been living in Hawaii and really a deep spiritual seeker um, connected to plant medicine. He had been a Thai masseuse in Thailand. He learned Thai massage. He went to India and belly danced, a unique human yogi. being. Yogi, like a master yogi. Wow. Um, and he was diagnosed right in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. So he's in Brooklyn and he mm -hmm. started documenting his journey on social media. I think he probably had been using social media more at that age, but um, he streamed his journey on social media, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, with cancer, his hol holistic treatments with cancer, his, you know, cold plunges. He was just share, share, sharing it with everybody. And one of my friends, Jojo Silverman, who was in Asheville, had been following him. So where I got involved was he had been streaming for about a year and a half, and he had ended up in Charlotte, mm -hmm. um, where his dad was living. And when he was in an inpatient hospice there, he basically put out in the universe, I want to die in community because he was dying alone during the pandemic and I want to film my dying process. And so Jojo heard the call and called me as the Asheville hospice doc. Ethan had spent some time here and our friend Scott Kirschenbaum, a filmmaker. Wow. And so that was like the on switch for me. It's sort of that moment of that call really was transformed my life in many ways. And the next two weeks that followed were just, it was sort of this mystical experience for me. We got him to Asheville where I was working um, and he was not allowed to film in that facility. Yeah. And that was a moment where I thought, okay, you know, um, I could make a choice. We could just say, okay, sorry, you know, we can't honor this man's dying wish or I could do what I could to support his wish. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. I did. I, we discharged him to a home overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains, rallied the whole Asheville community that, that I knew, all everybody I knew that would may be interested and gave him a dying experience, offered him a dying experience that really reflected how he had lived. And so as he was dying, he, he was in the other, I was in the other room with Jojo speaking and Ethan was in the other room dying. And I just had this knowing I had to step out into this next chapter of my life, not knowing what the heck it would look like, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and so that, that was what happened. I put my notice in and just jumped in the river that has guided me here and the emergence of the center um, as a result. That is beautiful. Thank you for sharing every part of that. It makes me feel like I reflect it even more often than I realized. Thank you, Tom. The art of letting go, 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 in terms of his story, his choice, his choosing of that word, and then we become community because of what he gathered into letting go, and letting go of your chapter of your life. You know, there are screenings happening, but it's not out sure, it's not distributed yet. So I'll, I'll keep you posted. Yeah. If you let me know, I can set it up on the, on the platforms that we're sharing. You can go to the last ecstatic days movie.com website and sign up for the newsletter. Okay. And then you'll know local screenings. Um, the AARP just screened it in Pax oh, Library. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was sold out too. I mean, it was packed in there. Yeah, people are hungry for this conversation. 
And it's, you know, after being so like kind of in the closet, literally I worked in a closet <laughs> my job. Um, and just being kind of the weird one who's pursuing this path to having this conversation with such ease and yeah, with support, it's really beautiful. There's a shift, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> and there's never been anything like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, seeing that movie for the first time, I was just, I mean, not just because he had what my mom had, but the, the fact that his choice, that that's what he wanted to do, and it was affirmed and validated by a community that showed up in this massive way to tend to this person in the way that he really wanted to. And his family that showed up and getting to meet his mom afterwards and just all of these journeys, your journey, the journey of everybody that was a part of it came together and became this one journey. And now it's like, it feels like a movement, you know? And in many ways, it sounds like a, what precipitated the opening of the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. Will okay. you speak to how the center came to life? Yeah. So, you know, after I did my doula training in 2017, I had a strong knowing that I wanted to do something um, and got the name Center for Conscious Living and Dying. It was an LLC. So I had the name. Um, and then Cassie Barrett, who runs Carolina, ran Carolina Memorial Sanctuary, the green yes. burial ground in town. Yeah. She joined me and we started doing, it was more of a passion project alongside everything else we were doing. And it was going to be an education hub. And then when he died, um, things shifted. It became clear it wanted to be a nonprofit and community was at the heart of it, which was a shift from what we had thought. So really, I just started following the breadcrumbs. I was making all these beautiful synchronistic connections one thing led to the next, and a friend, Sherry Kay, who's now our volunteer coordinator, she told me about this beautiful property that was um, her friend was selling before it went on the market. And I remember driving near Warren Wilson. It's a beautiful road. I don't know if you've ever been, if you haven't been, you're welcome to visit. Um, and I remember driving through the trees and coming to this beautiful um, home, but more more just the energetics of the land there and the mountains. And I just thought, where the heck am I? You know. And it was so powerful. And it was way over, out of our price range. We had no money. Um, but that didn't stop me from just following it, you know. And so one thing led to the next. Connections were made. Grad, I mean, the generosity of donors has wow. helped. One donor in particular, David Case, helped purchase the property. So we're using it rent-free for three years and then trying to buy it back is the goal. Um, and then just opened up volunteering, thinking it would just be a slow trickle, and it became this sort of wave. Yeah. <laughs> a wave. deluge. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's been a journey and powerful. And the Center for Con the Conscious Living part of what we're doing is way bigger than I imagined. You Can know? you speak to that? Or would you like to? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what I, I think, you know, what, it's back to what I spoke to about preparing for death. And what does it mean to be fully human with all our parts, you know, our shadows, our joys, our sorrows? And and what does it mean to show up for one another with eyes wide open, consciousness? You, you can define that different ways, but that's how I, I use that word. Mm -hmm. um, eyes wide open. And so so the broad the how broad it is is that you can so many things apply, conscious relating, conscious communication. Um, so we have programming for all of those things. Mm -hmm. And volunteers, members are offering their gifts. So I've learned a lot about inter internal family systems. I've learned so much in that conscious, you know, um, just conscious living encompasses so much. So. I had no idea that that was, I mean, I, I realized the title was Conscious yeah. Living and, and, and Dying, but I did not realize that there was that kind of training or that kind of volunteership and education yeah. component. Yeah, it's a big part of it. That's yeah, one of the main, major branches, education, direct mm -hmm. care. Um, and guidance and support, uh, conscious community. Yeah, Claire, what Yeah, because it's supporting that connection to impermanence. But the best, the thing that cracks, I mean, it's just funny because when we when we were figuring out, like, um, you know, how to get generate some more funds for it, and you you decided on like Airbnbs. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, yeah, some of the rooms. And then it was like, well, is that going to be awkward? Like people coming <laughs> like staying in this room and we're like holding a vigil over there like behind a curtain or like someone's dying in that room 
and I remember like the conversation when we had it with you and you were like, no, that's the conscious living part. Mm -hmm. And then when you, and we were all like, you know, what's like so soft, like we'd be like whispering, like, oh, we can't. And you were like, we don't need to do that. And it was this moment though, it was huge for all of us. Cause we were like, we stood up straighter and we were like, oh yeah, we can talk in a normal voice. Like it's okay. But it was a piece of it that I hadn't even thought about of because we knew families would come, but like people just coming and staying there, knowing that they're signing up to stay in this room that also houses the dying and families who are grieving. It's really powerful. And it, it's that conscious living piece that I always think about because the living and the dying, you know, cohabitating in, in lots of different ways. Which yeah, circles yeah. right back to what what you were mentioning at the very beginning of this conversation when you were growing up and going back to India and seeing the joy and the grief and the celebration mm -hmm. and the food and the children begging all of that together in space and not segregated, not separated and, and tucked apart. So in action, right. you what, what does it look like? We're, yeah. we're experimenting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so conscious living in, in terms of education for internal family systems or, or just like how do you live in a more conscious way but also in practice and in, in the facility itself people can rent an airbnb space and can come and stay <laughs> and there isn't a sense of walking on eggshells around that but, but trying to really make this a warm communal space where there's joy and there's grief and there's the grateful dead and maybe there's quiet and there might be a vigil or some fire in the back yeah, end. Totally. but but it's that tapestry that quilt um, mm -hmm. this is this is bringing all the threads together. Yeah, and the multi-generational component is yes. pretty big. So Warren Wilson, you, we can see the campus from the oh. property and the students are coming from there to, to do landscaping and many of them have, and, and other things, internships and things. Okay. And they've commented on, wow, it's so nice to see these children here and these elders and all of us just being together in one space and it's been beautiful. It feels to me and my very non-expert opinion here, that that's how it's supposed to be. Um, mm -hmm. What about the conscious dying part? Do you want to speak more to to how the center is facilitating that? I mean, you have a lot in, so far in this conversation, mm -hmm. but is there anything that you haven't shared that you want to about how the Center for Conscious Living and Dying is is unique or? Yeah, I've asked, you know, so there are other models of community supported end of life care that exist. And there's a, we're basing some of what we're doing on the Omega Home Network model. Okay. So during the AIDS crisis, these homes popped up um, and volunteers opened up their space and took care of these people that were dying of AIDS that couldn't go home. And so those exist. Um, and I asked a volunteer there because he was commenting on how what we're doing is subtly different. So I asked him, like, what is different about your experience volunteering for one of those traditional homes and what you're seeing with us? And he said, when I go to, to volunteer, the energy of the space is still that death is the worst thing that could be happening to this family and this person. And there's a lot of energy of pity. And so that's, and that's something I, I, I did the same thing. I was yeah. like, wow. And then what I see you all doing is really honoring that death is this sacred passage. And that is a fundamental difference. Huge. You know, huge. And so we do that by infusing compassion, mindfulness, contemplation into everything we do. Um, and yeah, honoring death as a, as a great teacher and a sacred passage. Yeah. And the process of getting to a place where we feel comfortable with it, we honor that process too. And a lot of the trainings we do for volunteers coming in to, to sit bedside or whatever they want to do, offering experiences to um, kind of land in their own process of dying and what it would feel like to let go of attachments that they have in their life. I mean, we do exercises and practices like that and trainings, um, you know, in the container that we've built that feels okay to do that in. And then coming back together as a group to, to talk about that experience and what came up. And, that, and that's how we do that. Through conversation, through experience, through safe experience, through seeing what it would feel like to really let go of everything we hold so dear 
and shift the perspective of how that could look, um, how we could be more conscious of doing that, not till the moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, when I think about the death of Ethan and Ethan's death and my mother-in-law's death, um, Jay's mom is one of my dearest friends on the planet. Her name is Paula Brown and she died in my, our home in 2019. Um, and she died with aromatherapy, acupuncture, mistletoe injection, CBD, all these modalities that were, you know, presented for her and offered to her. And so she didn't need a whole lot of pharmaceutical medications for pancreatic cancer, which is notoriously painful. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, you know, when I think about consciousness and conscious dying, you know, some people ask, is it, does it mean, you know, you're going to be alert and awake at the time of the moment of death, um, which some traditions strive for. So, so if that is the case, if that's how people interpret it, then we do offer a mm -hmm. holistic, supportive experience to the different modalities. So just thought to say that. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. sharing that. Sharing so much of both of your personal, sometimes I can feel it. I'm speaking, I'm speaking very quietly again. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing a lot of your personal stories, which sound deeply interwoven with why you're doing the work that you're doing and, and the spirit and the passion behind community centered grief support and also end of life care. Um, it, it sounds like you at the Center for Conscious Living and Dying, there's both holistic options that might not be available elsewhere. Also the ability to really be met where that family or that individual wants to be met and develop unique relationships around the dying process and the grieving process and then maintaining those connections beyond. And I think I've heard you say over the course of the conversation that you would ideally like maybe families to engage with the center before they're at a place of losing a, a person in their lives or dying themselves and beginning to maybe volunteer. Is that, is that something that people can do right now? Yeah, still? there's open events, there's volunteers and yeah, different ways to plug in. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, sure. I want to check in. Is there anything you want to add before I open the floor to questions? Just grateful to talk about it. Yeah. I'm so grateful That's you both great. came and, and that you shared everything you did. I'm so grateful that you came. I keep talking quietly. I'm sorry to the people online. I'm sorry to the people who are here. Uh, it's, it's a really sacred topic. <laughs> I hadn't realized how hard it would be to project loudly while, while talking. I start to whisper almost <laughs> when we're talking. Yeah. So, it does. Yeah. It, so there's and something I, about it. I feel like I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thumbs up. Well, and it's interesting because in, in my hospice experiences, I've, I've had both where mm -hmm. we're blasting but my family and I are blasting, uh, you know, Buena Vista Social Club and, and singing Guantanamera <laughs> and also whispering and being very quiet. And it seems interesting. Yeah. Um, so I would love to just want to applause. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. You. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for coming here. Thank you. Questions. Does anybody want to ask any questions about the art of letting go, dying, conscious dying, conscious living, conscious dying, or the center? Please. Um, thank you. All three of you, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and I do want to say the film is extraordinary. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. So moving. Probably the most moving. At the, the time that I saw it, it's probably the most moving like, media that I've seen. So thank you for doing that. It's highly recommend. Um, and I want to ask um, so my, my parents are aging um, in fairly good health right now, but I feel a lot of resistance from them as generally pretty open people, but I have tried to talk to them about some of their wishes and, you know, I, I really want to know. I want to be able to, um, to support them in the ways that they want and also in ways that feel well grounded to me. Um, but I'm getting discouraged and I wonder if, if either of you um, just have some advice on that, like how to to not push them and like be confident and hold some space for them. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question with the mic right here. And also repeat that you said the, the film, The Last Ecstatic Days, was incredible and very inspiring and everyone should watch it, which is the first thing you said. <laughs> and, then, and then also the question is, when you have parents who are pretty healthy but are approaching end of life and yet they're very resistant to having conversations about the dying process, how can you navigate that? Do you have any advice? 
Did I capture your question? Yeah, it okay. could be more broad than parents or my specific situation, but I can see that. When there are loved ones or people in your life who you want to talk about the dying process or grieving process with, and they don't want to have that conversation, what do you recommend? <laughs> So interesting. Um, just two weeks ago, Huffington Post reached out and asked the same question. And so I gave them my advice. And so I, I'll share that with you, that article. And I read one of the comments and it was very, there was a lot of anger at the article and what was presented by other, there, it wasn't just me, it was other people. But it was, it was the, met with so much resistance from the people reading it. Like, why would we talk down to our parents or why why do you assume that they can't make these decisions for themselves and why do we have to handhold and why do we have to push them so that's one approach like there's some, some would say there's nothing you can do right other than offer an opening to have the conversations so the, that might be the case for some people others just by um sharing with them anything personal that's coming up for you like being vulnerable with them saying mom and dad this is what I'm feeling and let's, can we talk about it? And they may have it all figured out and they just don't want to tell you because they don't think you're comfortable talking about it. So I think being vulnerable with them maybe is one way. If it's met, if it's met that great, then you can start to just deepen in the conversation and actual logistical, practical things. If it's not met, then at least they know you're interested and you're available when they're ready. And sadly, many people don't have these conversations until until last minute or not at all. So I'll definitely share that article though. <laughs> I wrote it down and okay. I'll try and add it to our online form as well. Okay. It's on my website, adtsethymd.com and then there's like uh, links to articles. Awesome. And I'll also put that up. Okay. Claire, did you want I to mean, I was going to say pretty much this. <laughs> <laughs> Be because, mainly because like what we've been saying throughout this whole talk about the power of vulnerability and conversation. So there's a part, like an education part, where you're like, well, here's some options, or here's your resources, or here's this and here's that. But it's just like telling a grieving person like a bunch of information. It's it's too much. And it's OK to say, I hear that you're not ready to speak about this. Mm -hmm. I understand why you aren't ready to speak about this. Mm -hmm. Like, really just taking a minute. like how it would feel for someone to say that to you, you know, because the way we view aging and debt, all of that in our culture is very far from speaking in that way. So saying, saying that, and then saying what it's bringing up for me is, and it's huge. I think about my mom, she didn't have anything planned out. And after she died, I'm sitting in a funeral home and I'm having to figure it out. And it was like on top of grieving, it was so overwhelming. And I remember thinking, well, she didn't live inside the box when she was here. She was a total kook. So I'm not <laughs> gonna put her in a box, I know that. But like, it was a real like wake up for me that I didn't broach it enough either because of things that she had talked about or just whatever. And so there was a moment where like, there's a lot of agency with that we can hold in that way too that provides others to feel safe to do the same yeah i was thinking you know advanced directives i think 30 percent of our population has them so but that is a place to start filling out the basic forms and that's a nice way to start the conversation um and and some people say visit that after every decade or with divorce or illness you know or change in debility if you have debility then Certain times you revisit that, but that's one way to kind of start the conversation. Our friend Greg says there's never a good time to talk about death. You talk about it when you're healthy, parents are like, ah, you know, why are you bringing this up? If it's Thanksgiving dinner table when we're all together, that's not the right time. When somebody's diagnosed with something, it's not the right time because you want to have hope. So really, when is a good time? And that's the big question. And being with the fear, right? The, the natural fear, because you talk to someone about you're aging, and they immediately like that means I'm dying, and it's like, well, I'm dying too. <laughs> but you know, like mm -hmm. reframing the language so it becomes reciprocal, and not another opportunity to, to say you're over here and I'm over here. Like, I think as a child, as a parent, if you are parents, then you know, if your child were to come to you, it is it's painful for probably the parent, you know, 
and not wanting to, to cause more harm to their child. It's probably subconsciously wanting to protect you, right? So, many layers. I gave them a copy of the immortal. Ooh, but I'll talk about it. Any other ones? There's so many. It's like subtle. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Frank Franco Sosesky wrote a really beautiful. I love him. He does a lot with the Upaya Zen Center out um, in New Mexico. He wrote a book called The Five Invitations, and that's a really beautiful book. And I like the word invitation. Mm -hmm. Um, Francis Weller is one of my all-time favorite. The Wild Edge of Sorrow was one of the first books I was given after my mom, and that changed. It it was a game changer for me. Um, He speaks about building an apprenticeship with sorrow. Oh, Mm -hmm. that's beautiful. And just the word apprenticeship. That so even if you're trying to broach a conversation about aging with your parents, there's still an opportunity for you to build an apprenticeship in that way too. Mm -hmm. The only thing of the only thing I would add, because all of that was so rich and beautiful, is the only thing that has worked with the elders in my family is to say, I it's really important to me to honor you. And I really, really want to respect whatever it is that you want. And I I really need that. Is there anything you can tell me about what you want? Um, it would mean so much to me if I could honor you in that in this way. Uh, any other questions? We're, we're right at seven o'clock. So to respect your time, every time, sorry, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, you have a question? <laughs> That's a, I thought you were saying that I was talking too quietly again. <laughs> Go on, Dr. Lewis, what's your question? Uh, I think recently you said something about attending a grief survey, uh, even though you've been working in hospice for years, you'd be surprised at how much you were holding in your body. Uh, When you sit with someone um, who's grieving, sometimes you know viscerally that they've been through it too. They're not trying to change it, fix it, make it better. And it's something they hold in their body because grief is broken. Um, Could you speak to how that grief ceremony got to the place where you could let go and how that has changed your experience doing the work? Thank I'm going to make sure I repeat that because it's heard. That was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question is, can can you speak to how the grief ceremony that you went to in your death doula training helped you to break open the grief in your body that you were holding, kind of compartmentalized in different mm-hmm. areas, and, and how that worked for you? Did I capture that? Yeah. And I will say since then, we've offered grief ceremonies as a community. And I think what happened in that experience was there was live music and drumming. Yeah. So there's the vibration, there's the sound, there's movement, there's um, that support of the music. And then there was storytelling, everybody going around sharing. And so there was also an opportunity to wail and to cry in front of each other. And as stories were being shared and as the grief was, you know, arising and the, the sorrow was arising it, versus just holding it together. So that just in, in and of itself amplified things and it enabled me to just allow whatever wanted to move to move. So... Yeah. Claire, have you had any experiences with, well, as a grief consultant, creative grief consultant, <laughs> what do you know about helping grief to come out and and getting it shared? I mean, there's so much to say, but one of the reasons why I focus on being a creative grief practitioner is because I believe we need multiple pathways to experience and meet our grief. And creativity is such a beautiful way to do that because the mediums you can use are endless. And so um, creating altars is a huge one. And ceremonies I've been a part of and have led with grief, just the simple act of creating an altar together, people bringing an object or not, and just having this space in the middle as an anchor is huge. and just creating touchstones that allow, like music is a touchstone to me, um, drumming, uh, the sound of someone crying, the sound of someone sharing their story. Like these are touchstones. These are ways that we uh, tap into that collective 
grief while also whatever may be untouched in us? In, in my very limited experience, I feel like hearing others wail gives permission somehow to make sounds that we're taught it's not okay to make. And with the drums and with the stories, that, that, that communal part of grieving gives us all the space to grieve more loudly and more deeply. And I feel like that's part of what opens up the body. In, in the Celtic tradition in Ireland, they're called keeners. Yeah. And there were actually people, women mostly, who were asked to come to funerals or to, you know, to sit bedside or be with people who were grieving to make the sounds for mm -hmm. them. And they were very loud and almost very primal. You can hear recordings of it. It's, it's, oh. deeply, it's deeply moving. Um, I went on a trip recently with other grief and death workers to Ireland to learn those kinds of things and how people used to um, approach death and grief, um, you, know, century, you know, decades, centuries ago. And that was one thing that was talked about a lot is this act of keening and what it means to really tap into kind of that primal place that we all hold and to really like release it, to really allow ourselves to let go and to have the people with us that, that can hold that. And or, and or share in that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's more of asking you to speak to the applicability of a, a different grief process in the services that the center provides. So when the grief process starts post-death because the death is an accident, I'm just asking, I guess, to speak to the applicability of all of this in that situation because I've learned so much about grief process starting before death. And so when it's all compressed and concentrated to the, um, you know, the post-death period of time, um, is that something that the center works with situations and families and, in that scenario? And if not, um, I guess just to speak to how all of this translates or transfers to that type of situation. I'm going to repeat the question again, as I understand it, and let me know if I, I missed something. Yeah, it, I, I, that, that I'm, so, <laughs> but I'm, I'm actually, I'm so grateful to you for asking this question because it's not something we've addressed at all in the conversation. Mm -hmm. What I heard you say is what, when there's a sudden death, what if it's, what if it's an accidental death? And I'll go beyond that and say accidental death or just sudden death. And there isn't this dying process where a family is allowed to come together and sit, which I get goosebumps just saying that because I'm thank you for asking. What, what if anything, does the center offer for families who are in a situation like that where someone has passed suddenly? Um, or what of these resources and tools and ideas would you recommend for those situations? I'll just speak briefly. Um, so one of the beautiful things about the center is it's emergent and I, I it may it always be so like responding to what's showing up and what needs arise and if it's not there then can we create an offering what i can share with you is that we have people in our community who have had experienced sudden death of loved ones and it comes up all the time and so these tools are very similar and how we use them how we utilize them and and how we hold space for whatever arises in those situations um, but there it is a unique experience for sure so I just wanted to name that, but yeah. It is very unique. And having just experienced that in June with a family member, as much as I've been studying and learning and experiencing grief, I, it, none of that prepared me for that kind of grief. And it's been a whole other realm I've come to learn about and find resources specifically for that. Um, I'm actually like working to create some sort of a program around I'm calling them realms of grief because I believe they're realms and sudden loss and the trauma with that being its own thing, unlike anything else. And there's, yeah, there's people in our community who, who have a lot more background with that work. Um, 
but there is some really beautiful alan wolfelt he's the director of the center um, for life transitions he's written a lot of books on how to companion the bereaved um, but he's written some books specifically on like suicide sudden loss that's they're really really beautiful there's like a book and then a workbook that kind of goes along with it so like you said emerging it's definitely an area to to continue to educate ourselves and and bring in like we haven't physically had that experience of someone coming at the center in that way but it's a huge it's a huge piece that people experience constantly so. thank you Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. I think for the sake of time, because we're 10 minutes after 7, I'm going to go ahead and call this at the end. Is that okay? Sure. All right. One more round of applause, baby. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're done.